with me today, and I don't know if you can see our webcams, but uh, you will uh, you will in a minute. Uh, we have Darius from the city of Chicago. We have Jay uh, from Lockheed Martin. We have Fanny, which I can tell you he does not look the same at all today with his COVID-19 beard <laughs> from the um, American Red Cross. And finally, also Ken from Red Cross, who will talk about uh, quite a different um, topic. Right. The topics we will um, discuss with these uh, great panelists uh, will be around COVID-19, how perhaps behaviors of uh, some users have changed um, around analytics. So quite an, I thought it was interesting uh, personally to, um, to, to see this, uh, you know, how, how things have changed for, 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 for everybody. Uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about hybrid analytics. So a mix of SAP Analytics Cloud and SAP Business Objects. Um, some experiences around business objects upgrades. Uh, the reality of having multiple BI tools. I'm sure that's something that concerns uh, all of you um, on, the, on, on the call today. And we'll finish with a database migration. Right, let me, let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, I don't know if uh, people can see us on the webcam. I'll assume we can. So um, I wanted to say uh, thanks for everybody for joining as well from the West Coast. Still mid morning for you from the East Coast. Perhaps some of you are on your lunchtime. I'm live from London in the UK, so it should be pub time if I could leave. So cranberry juice with or without. With or without. Additional substances. We don't know where that's yet. And we can all see you. You can all see us. Excellent. Okay, Darius. Um, when we spoke um, previously, you know, one of the questions I had for you is, you know, now that everybody is working from home, now that people uh, cannot necessarily do the same same jobs they were doing as before, I was just asking if the way business objects is used at city of chicago if maybe it was more critical or if behaviors had changed and uh, you had quite a interesting uh, um, 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 thing to say about all this you have to unmute yourself uh, darius uh hello everyone um yes yes patrick um we um have been a long time business office customers so have a very established and a rather large environment at the city of Chicago. And, and so it's a primary reporting tool uh, for almost 20 years. However, in the past month and a half or two months, I have never seen anything like that. I mean, the interest and uh, our business objects and other reporting or BI tools have just skyrocketed. Everybody wants uh, reports, access to data, pretty dashboards, and it has to be done, you know, done now. So my my traffic like tripled, uh, you know, number of users uh, increased by like almost sixty percent, and everything had to be done quickly. And um, do you know? There's no do you time know why? for whole, you know metadata development. And do you know why? Do, do, do you know what happened? I mean, uh, do you have any explanation as to yeah, why just... suddenly there's this big uh, boost? Of course, I do. Uh, in COVID-19, obviously, uh, you know, um, as it's a local government, we have data the public wants to see, uh, especially health data. So everybody wants to, you know, in the past month and a half, various uh, applications like financial, HR, everything has been has been used has been used so in such a big demand. Um, so, so, for example. Um, you know, we also have, use other BI tools like Tableau and Power BI, and everybody wants dashboards, but there is no time to develop, uh, uh, you know, data sets. Uh, so just a little uh, note that, you know, we use business objects, extraction and uh, scheduling capabilities to create, uh, you know, text to CSV files, and these pretty dashboards connect to files uh, that are derived from business objects, but of course, no one knows that. Um, but that that speeds things up you know for example our health data these are thousands of thousands of tables we don't have time to develop um proper metadata layers so we use 
established universes, and we have over 400 of them. So pretty flexible as far as data access. Uh, so obviously, my so so BI became this bulk backbone of our BI environment. So it has to run smoothly. There is no time for any delays or any issues. So 360 tools obviously uh, very helpful in this situation. So so it's been really uh, you know hacked. Yeah, just just to let you know that our mayor. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot is uh, all of a sudden a business intelligence uh, customer. Uh, obviously, she's the first one who wants to see uh, real-time data, uh, correct data, either through business objects or other tools. Um, so, and also we're using excellent BO scheduling and distribution capabilities that are missing from other tools to distribute these to the public. I'm talking about outside websites and within the city as well. And um, you also mentioned um, that, especially on social media, uh, in the news as well, there is so much analytics with statistics being presented and information. You said that this perhaps gave um, um, some people who were not too experienced with, with analytics, gave them some incentive to perhaps try to, well, to do more. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, right now, just give you an example, uh, John Hopkins University, most popular dashboard in the world, because everyone's looking at it. You know, that's actually Tableau, that's um, Tableau um, desktop uh, uh, dashboard. So, uh, and all of a sudden, everyone wants to, you know, drill in, wants to understand, wants to analyze the data, have access to data. Uh, so, and you know, obviously publish it and with local government, we have laws that, you know, Freedom of Information Act that we are uh, required to publish it. Uh, we have a number of um, media requests as well uh, for um, real time data. Uh, so it's really, it's been it just uh, nonstop, basically nonstop. And it's it's been pretty challenging and also interesting. So from getting data to people from and then going to basic level you know online uh to get people going on various tools uh like i said there is no time for official channels of communication or proper way of doing it just we need to get the job done basically so so that's that's the environment now and uh i don't see it changing quickly to be honest good well that's very interesting thank you very much for sharing Sure. Okay, next, um, I'd like to, to, to welcome Ken. Ken, uh, as I said before, works um, at the Red Cross. Um, long term, long term, and uh, um, a big fan of business objects and especially the universes. <laughs> We've discussed this many times over the years. And um, Ken will soon do a, uh, uh, well, I'm looking forward to see his session um, about SAP business objects hybrid. Uh, that he's going to run with the SAP Insider in the next few days or few weeks, I'm not sure. Um, but Ken, uh, can you explain where 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 did it come from? Uh, it came from to start using SAC and uh, um, how how you evaluating all this? Um, yeah, can you can you explain a bit on this? Oh, and you unmute, Ken. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Whoops. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, can you see me okay? okay? Perfect. So the Red Cross has been using Business Objects Enterprise for 20 years. Because of that, we have many well-designed universes and a very sophisticated user community. So it's only natural that we would use SAC in a hybrid environment, I mean, to leverage those semantic layers. And Although there is some overlap in SAC and business objects in functionality, and as Gregory Baticcio said in the first webinar, that gap is narrowing, but still they have different core capabilities. So I feel that they complement each other very much. And what is really important to me is that in a hybrid environment, when you're sharing universes, that means that you don't have to re-architect your data for SAC. And um, 
as you know, um, I feel that the information design tool is the most powerful semantic layer tool in the industry. So, you know, the ability for SAC to leverage that is is really great and to be able to have such robust semantic layers. Okay, so today you're using Webby. Well, for the last 20 years, 20 years even Webby, you have super yeah. strong universes, you trust the data, the users now know to how to do all this, but now you're going to introduce a new BI solution, Analytics Cloud. I guess, I guess a simple question, which, um, you know, we have a few hundred people here on the line today. Why, why not just continue using Webby if the plan is to consume universes with an analytics cloud? Well, at its most basic level, SAC, um, the, what its core capability is, is to build interactive data visualizations and in the form of dashboards or, or stories. And that interactivity requires very fast performance. And um, SAC sits on top of HANA. So once the data is acquired, it's, you know, the that response time is instantaneous. And that's really what you need for interactive dashboards. So, you know, when you build a model inside of SAC with um, in a hybrid environment and you're accessing a universe, it doesn't really matter how long the queries take. You can schedule them in the morning. You can acquire the data into SAC in, in it could be multiple models, right? Many models. And the performance will be instantaneous and you are able to link those models together and have those, um, what they call linked analysis in SAC where you can, and and on top of that, of course, there are other, there are other features like smart insights, smart discovery, you know, predictive and planning and things that aren't part of Webby at this time. Is it? And that's, that capability is there with SAC. Okay, so SAC, you can you can have live connectivity with the universes. Um, do, the way you've just described it here is the import capability. So this older method of you know using SAC. So you're acquiring the data, and then the power of it is to leverage all these extra functionalities. Right. And we tend to we tend to use import more than acquire because at this time at least. When you're importing, you have more of the core features of SAC available. When you're using um, a live query, um, a lot of those features aren't um, aren't um, available yet. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And and therefore, is that fair to say that you will continue to use your on-prem, um, you know, old school 4.2 business objects for operational reporting, scheduling, yes. that sort of things? <clears throat> oh, for sure. Because there are. I mean, there are things you can do in Webby that you can't do in anywhere, anywhere else. Um, you know, in, we have universes that have hundreds of tables, thousands of objects, and for a user to be able to browse through that many objects and build reports, um, you know, you can't really do that with any other, um, you know, self-service cloud-based tool. Okay, okay, that's very interesting. Thank you, Ken, we'll come back to you a bit later. Okay. Um, Next, um, next we have Jay from Lockheed Martin. Hello, Jay. Hi. Jay, um, what are you drinking, Jay? I've asked you earlier, but I don't remember. It I'm on my, I, I'm on my unhealthy fourth cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Well, um, kind of energy drink here, so you know, not better. <laughs> not better. Okay, Jay. Um, when we spoke last week, um, you know. Same thing. We talked about COVID and hybrid and all of these things, and uh, we we came we came about talking about uh, multi BI solution, right? So um, it's Darius mentioned earlier uh, Tableau and Power BI. Ken Ken talked about the same thing as well at the Red Cross. You guys have multi BI solutions, right? 
Yeah, so we've been, uh, the way Lockheed Martin operates is we have different business areas, you know, over the years through all these different acquisitions, right? So we have uh, aeronautics, for example, and space and rotary mission systems, which own Sikorsky. Um, we have missiles and fire control. And we operate in a very decentralized manner in, in a lot of respects when it comes to our BI. So each of our B, uh, business areas has a business objects environment and business objects has been in Lockheed Martin you probably, I think I went down and, and there's even back to the Crystal uh, Decisions days and Crystal Server. So um, probably 15, 20 years uh, at least that I'm aware of. And we have each BA that has uh, their own business objects instances. They all have their own HANA instances. And so we have combined probably 20,000 or so active users. And then we also have an enterprise-wide uh, shared uh, Tableau server with each business area has their own site on the server. And across all those sites, we have about 23,000 active users. And when I say active users, those are users that have logged on at least once in the last 90 days. And then we have some small instances of uh, web focus and then Oracle uh, BI as well out there uh, and probably some shadow uh, IT things of, of, of ClickView server uh, and things of that nature. And I remember asking you, um, I mean, clearly business objects and Tableau seem to be the two big corporate official solutions. And you said there's a bit of shadow this and other, um, I mean, are departments allowed to just, you know, go and buy whatever they want? I would say for the most part that, you know, they can. I think we've developed a great, um, over the last several years, uh, an analytic COE and a data refinery where I think people um, have a place to go to find the tools that they need to understand what they need to use. I think if you would have talked to me even five, six, seven years ago, I think you had a tendency for organizations uh, or, or departments to go out and fund their own tools largely because they also maybe didn't even weren't even aware of the corporate solutions existence um, because there was a lack of a true center of excellence so we've been mm -hmm. maturing initially as a community of practice but also we have a tablet community of practice we have a business service community of practice but then also a larger coe that handles and budgets trade studies and visualization trade studies so we're starting to centralize that more at an enterprise level now and if somebody tomorrow goes to, to the COE and says, right, would like to do some analytics around, you know, something, are you going to say, well, for this, you have to use business objects or you have to use Tableau or people are free to use what they, what they want at the end of the day? So consultants answer, it depends, right? So I think if it's a tool that we've already brought to the table and we've evaluated before, um, and uh, for example, uh, Power BI, you know, we may say to, to the user, you know, this is something that we really, we reviewed this before, we really prefer that you use one of our corporate solutions. But then you have an example of, for, uh, for example, we have a large investment in, in, in SAP licensing, and so there's an interest in SAP Analytics Cloud. Well, of course, we have yet to evaluate that. We're actually currently under an evaluation. So we want to put the time in and, and budget and fund evaluations, trade studies where we compare different tools to each other. And we try to do that and refresh those studies on an annual basis and make them publicly available. And so that way, if somebody comes to us and they're interested in a tool, hopefully we've already evaluated it. We can provide them some, instead of just a, a no, we have uh, some data, some rankings, or some information within the Gartner quadrant to, to help them understand why we made the decision and then help guide them to the tool that uh, we recommend for that particular task. Now, having five BI solutions, maybe more, there are some obvious challenges um, financially, technically. Um, how, you know, how's it for you guys? Yeah, I think at first it was a real challenge because when you first deploy a tool, quite often you're deploying it in small segments and you don't really have any developed processes, standards, or best practices around those tools. So um, I think that can, uh, without a COE or, or some sort of community practice to help kind of wrap your hands around it, it can become a wildfire where you have a lot of unmanaged reporting, unmanaged solutions, uh, more than one redundancies and things like that. But I think we've managed pretty well to sustain and, and develop processes, standards, and then, you know, obviously teams of people develop, for example, with Tableau, it started off just a couple years ago or three years ago where we had 40 Tableau users. 
you know, that was just three years ago. Now we have 22,000 people engaging with Tableau server and consuming workbooks, and we have thousands of people with Tableau desktop deployed. So obviously you need to develop standards, processes, and governance around that. Um, I would say where we're trying to consolidate and reduce costs is some of these other tools that like web uh, web focus which were you know struggling with maintenance costs or changes to the environment every time you have to upgrade they have major impacts to the business we're trying to get off those solutions because we can accomplish a lot of those things with web intelligence for example or oracle biee where we're getting away from oracle licensing because of our, uh, a lot of our involvement with putting things into cloud as well as sap hana trying to consolidate and reduce costs from an enterprise corporate perspective that obviously leads to migrations from tools like oracle bie to a web intelligence for example okay so five bi solutions clearly five five license maintenance every year um means five five servers maybe not five servers but five five deployment <laughs> dev tests rather than different versions and patches and all that to manage with. So like you said, you're looking at consolidating, if, if possible, five going down to four or three different solutions. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, at, at some point you have to make a financial decision, especially when you're doing these evaluations and trade studies, you find key overlaps between tools, obviously. And at some point you have to make a decision and what your investment is going to be in. And I think because of our staunch investment and, and you know, clear experience with business objects and the fact that business objects continues to make it easier to upgrade the solution versus other tools like a web focus where it seems to become more difficult uh, to, to upgrade a solution. I mean, that's going to be a key driver in a lot of decisions in terms of maintenance and scalability. Seems to go in line with uh, Ken, what you mentioned earlier, right? You've had your large investment over many years around business objects. The use cases for it are still very strong, but uh, you want to, to have uh, additional capabilities around uh, visualization, and that's why you're now looking at, uh, well, another BI solution, basically. Excellent. Okay, Jay, thank you. We'll come back to you um, 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 at, at the end of this session for another topic. Um, okay, Pani, Pani from, from the Red Cross. That's the guy who had no beard on the picture, but now has a big beard. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, right, Pani, um, we know it was announced uh, by Gregory from SAP this morning that uh, BI 4.3 will be released in a couple of weeks, which is great. Um, it is for some going to, to trigger um, either an upgrade or a migration project at some point this year or early next. And uh, when you and I have spoken last week, you mentioned that you guys have just completed your upgrade to BI 4.2. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Do you want to talk a bit about, you know, um, the sort of platforms you have and the environments, number of maybe users, reports, uh, universes, maybe some of the challenges you had? Yeah, sure. Um... As um, uh, Ken mentioned, he's also from Red Cross, right? And we are here uh, past 20 years, and we've been using Webby for 20 years now. And as you know, the experience that we have done major uh, upgrades in the past. Uh, I would say the last upgrade, I would say it was really peaceful. I can say my users are also very happy after the upgrade. Um, the reason behind this is I could say I would like to give the credit to that 360 product. I, I, there is no, uh, you know, a hidden secret there. I think many of you experienced it, but I felt the same. Uh, 360 product was uh, really helped us to migrate uh, from 4.1 to 4.2. Uh, we just completed uh, three months back. Um, as uh, Ken mentioning, we have different lines of services. We support uh, around 2,500 users. Before upgrade, it was 4,000. You know, after, as you know, uh, how 360 really helped us in to clean up that user base, and around 2,500 now migrated to the new environment. Okay, so. Yeah, this 4.1 environment clearly for many years because 4.1 is now is, is now quite old. You wanted to migrate for 4.2, so did you migrate 
did you upgrade, sorry, on the same server or you decided to, to take the approach of building a new 4.2 servers and then migrate the content? Yeah, great question, uh, um, Patrick. Uh, that's where another improvement, I would say, um, as I mentioned, the first aspect is to help us to prepare the upgrade. The second aspect is, the, is to maintain the parallel environment to 4.1, uh, establish the different environment. And uh, we use the feature in 360 incremental uh, uh, data migration. That is the best feature I could see um, uh, because we can maintain parallel environments and also ask users to test their um, reports uh, near real time. Uh, we did incremental every day, a uh, couple of days, a uh, week part, and they can see what they did yesterday in the new environment uh, today. Um, that is the wonderful feature that uh, we really took advantage of, uh, of 360 Suite. Yeah, okay, so you went to this new server, so you did the full migration, you know, you migrated all the users, the reports, and, 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 and everything, and obviously during the testing phase, your old environment is still working, right? There's still people doing things, you're still scheduling stuff. Okay, so you said that you use one of the 360 solution, um, which is which is our promotion and backup solution indeed. So um, to, to do a Delta migration, once you were ready to go live to say, hey, bring me everything that has changed only in the source environment, bring that Delta in the new environment, and then you went live, that sort of things. Correct. Correct. That is the wonderful feature. Everybody can take that. Uh, that strategy really works because you will see those uh, delta uh, near real time and then users will be happy. Yes, they trust the upgrade. That's why users were very happy uh, to see their content um, uh, right away and then approve the UAT. And that really helped us in less downtime and also the resources that we spent uh, on upgrade, uh, really reduced to 50%, I could say, because in the past upgrades, we have to use professional services and do a big project. We achieved this within three months in this migration. And you said you did it yourself without external consultancy. Correct. And then um, finally, um, you you mentioned when we started, uh, you've done a lot of cleanup. Can you Can you expand on this? What sort of things have you cleaned and how? For example, uh, we did the uh, uh, reports to get the uh, usage stats. Uh, what was their usage? What when they logged in? Who did not log in for past X number of days? And we can able to communicate with, with confidence that hey, this is you have so many so many unused reports in favorites. Um, are you really interested in migrating? Um, or um, uh, we we took another approach is that you know cut down the inbox document. You know, we, we, we say that, okay, we are going to do only uh, 25 top of your inbox documents. Um, so that kind of strategy uh, we played uh, based on uh, the reports that we have available in 360 Suite. And uh, we communicated with confidence. That is the most important thing here. Um, uh, in the past, as many of business objects users know, we have to depend on the external spreadsheet that uh, it's available on forums uh, we have to download that and run reports and do a lot of tedious job but whereas this cleanup job is really just easy to communicate with our user base very very good okay um we'll come back uh, we'll, we'll come back to you before the end of this session i just wanted to thank everybody who asked questions there's some questions directly at some of you panelists i'm not telling you which Oh, unless you can see on the interface, so we'll come back to the questions uh, in a few minutes. Um, um, Jay, um, back to you. Another topic we we talked about, and um, earlier this morning, um, 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 I did cover the same topic, right, of database migration. This morning, I used the example of moving from on-premise Microsoft SQL Server to uh, Snowflake in, in, in the cloud. That's just... Uh, one example, obviously, but you guys went through a similar um, activity recently. 
Yeah, so touching based on back on when I talk about consolidating, we talk about consolidating BI tools, but we're also consolidating data warehouse technology. You know, uh, we have as an organization, as we develop these COEs, we have important decisions to make around the cost effectiveness of, of supporting uh, large data warehouses and Oracle in addition to SAP HANA. Uh, and especially as we are also migrating a lot of data into Hive tables with Presto views into uh, data lake, into data lakes uh, in the cloud. And so, you know, we're reducing a lot of the overhead uh, by getting, having these either solutions, we've are uh, are going to be lower cost in, in AWS, but also we've got a large investment in SAP, so we are steadily migrating data out of Oracle, and either putting it in the cloud or putting it into SAP HANA, and so that means we have a lot of uh, pre-existing universes and reports that are impacted um, that have been developed off of these Oracle tables uh, uh, and views over the years. So 360Is was paramount to us to give us insight into exactly what was being used and also the data lineage information so we could see exactly what uh, not only what objects in a universe were being used, so if 80% of the universe wasn't even being used, we could identify those columns and those tables that we aren't using. Uh, we could then match that up with the Oracle DBA's log files and say, hey, you know, we're not seeing usage on these tables. Uh, are you seeing any usage outside of, you know, maybe there's people still hitting those tables outside of business objects through other connections. But for the most part, because we largely were using business objects, we could we could decide not to move those tables into SAP HANA. And that's a huge cost issue, uh, the, just the sheer amount of data that you're moving into SAP HANA, there's cost implications there. So that was hugely important to us. And then also obviously to business objects administrative perspective, we could identify similar to what Pani was talking about, is to, you know, do we really need to, uh, you know, move all this content into another business objects environment? Because we basically took the opportunity to stand up, when we stood up SAP HANA, we stood up brand new business object servers. And then as content, this legacy content uh, is, uh, as the legacy tables or Oracle are moved into HANA, then we will create new universes and then transition those reports over to that environment. And obviously it's a lot of time and effort. We don't wanna be moving a bunch of stuff that hasn't been used. So that's hugely important to us is having that insight into that usage information, but also the lineage information. Okay, so just to go back um, one second ago on the on the project. So Oracle, I assume on-premise, right? Correct. And then is your HANA on-premise as well? Yes, SAP is on-prem. SAP is on-prem, and then on AWS, is that on RDS, I guess? Yeah, so we're actually using S S3 buckets and, uh, yep. and creating Hive tables. Okay, excellent. So Oracle on-prem, some of it to HANA, some of it to AWS, and then, um, um, like you said, um, instead of randomly just moving all of the data and then assuming that all of the reports or universes would need to be you know, looked at or rebuilt or, or, or tested, you then use 360 eyes to do all that analysis for you. Yeah, it saved us, you know, probably at least uh, $100,000 in labor just from the business objects administrative perspective um, over the course of that migration. But also the migration is still taking place from a data perspective. And I mean, there's un probably hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're saving in licensing costs, you know, and, and uh, impact to storage uh, by reducing the footprint of all these legacy uh, data warehouse tables that we're, we don't have to move into SAP HANA. Now, this one is not planned, but Jay, are you saying we should sell 360i for $100,000 and it would be cheaper? <laughs> I'll leave that up to you guys. <laughs> it is not $100,000 for everybody on the line, right? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jay. And um, for, for those of you who'd like to, again, see 360i's um, in the context of a database migration, we'll be more than happy to do a live demo, but again, this morning's session around uh, the Snowflake migration was recorded and you'll see a live demo of, uh, of me uh, using uh, these different solutions as well. Okay, that's awesome. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, before I go for a round of questions, um, uh, would uh, Darius, Ken or Penny, is there anything 
you know, anything else uh, you'd like to, to add around any, any of the topics? You know, I, w <clears throat> I would just add to um, what Panny was, you know, his talking about using 360 is we got really great support from you guys um, throughout the process. You know, anytime we had a, a problem at installation or using the tool, I mean, almost, you know, the same day we would get, um, you know, somebody to help us. So that was really great. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. Yeah, I can I can add one more thing. Um, what Penny was saying about the, uh, and Jay was saying actually about the, uh, using 360 to audit your universes and universe usage. And we're using it currently heavily to audit our uh, licenses. Because you know, with such an increased demand, uh, sometimes you don't have enough licenses. Obviously, you know, as being government entity, we don't have money. Uh, so it's a 360 tool has been really, really helpful. Uh, you know, analyzing who's actually using the tool, and then actually confronting people or users that say that, yeah, we use it, but no, you don't. There's, there's a proof. So um, very helpful using it every day, and. It was, uh, with 360 tools, we've been able to free up um, at least, as of yesterday, over 200 uh, viral licenses for uh, for BL. So, well, yeah. In addition um, to that, I mean, just cleaning up the schedules that people have is huge because you have all these schedules that get left out there, and so be able to identify uh, those or those that are failing regularly, and being able to implement either through manual or or to, through an automated process, being able to to clean those up is very important to system health. And, right. And also the approach that we took was uh, to migrate to only the recurring schedules, not to move everything. Um, Whereas that feature was not there in the past, in the previous migration, either you have to move all the content, everything. But in the 360, it allows us to just choose only those recurring um, uh, pending uh, schedules uh, to migrate to the parallel environment that we, did, um, we established. That is also another good feature that we can use. And guys, also, this is Bruno. Uh, we've got multiple questions. Uh, we've got a lot of questions actually around monitoring, which is actually no surprise because actually the needs around monitoring, a lot of people are actually asking us about monitoring these days because their BobJ platform is, is under a lot of stress. And so a lot of people want 360 Live. And I've got a question from uh, Kimberly, who is asking all the panelists, well, uh, what are you guys doing today to monitor your systems? Yeah, we obviously, uh, we use uh, uh, CMC as well, you know, the built-in features, alerts. Um, uh, so that's a DO tool. And on top of that, um, we, we use a 360 uh, CMC jobs as well um, and to monitor our scheduling. Uh, and also I use freeware on my Windows servers to monitor CPU usage and, and, and disk space as well. These are pretty basic, but very helpful tools. Um, and uh, using obviously, um, you know, I have uh, several reports using 360 um, uh, data extracts as well to uh, get email alerts if um, anything is out of my, uh, out of the, uh, my set guidelines as well. And these are all real time, um, in real time emails and text messages. Okay, Bruno, we have um, many other questions, um, which is which is awesome. We have a couple of polls, so let me start a poll. And while people end, uh, answer the poll, you can go ahead with the next question. Uh, right, and I think the first one will be <laughs> quite popular, actually. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, would you like to know no more about uh, the topics covered today? So hybrid. Upgrade and migration, multi BI, or uh, database uh, migration. We should have added COVID nineteen because there's a question from mm -hmm. Barbara uh, for 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 you, Darius, or anybody, and for that matter, um, the question is: What are the top three functions of three hundred and sixty suite that have been most instrumental in helping to meet your COVID nineteen demand? So. 
you know, as far as 360, like I like I said before, we use it um, heavily to monitor um, and make sure that the, the business office environment is available and you know humming at 100 percent, meaning there are no issues whatsoever. So that's the primary use. Uh, everything else, um, you know, uh, 360 backup um, recycle bin, which is awesome as well. Um, just in case there are you know accidental deletions but these are basically you know we use three we don't have all the modules that 360 uh, uh, offers but uh, we you know it's it's vital um, so so as far as the traffic to monitor the traffic using in conjunction with CMC features and 360 uh, CMC jobs as well I don't I know would say yeah I would say 360i is, is the auditing piece is very important uh, because we're building out and have been building out um, COVID specific analytics and dashboards. And so having the ability to provide our leadership insight into the value of those things, whether to pursue additional uh, requirements that are coming in. Um, obviously, if there are all these requirements coming in for a specific dashboard, because it seems that very important. Uh, we have limited developer resources, right? So do we want to continue building something that's not being used? So, you know, that's that's an important piece and I think it's under undervalued. Thank, yeah, thank you. And and, and on this, it, it was not uh, the, a, a topic for today, but I'll mention it since the question came up. Um, we are offering um, um, for three months free of charge um, the package of 360 plus and 360 live which are the backup and server monitoring solution because we understand that for some people business objects might be more business critical than it was before so uh, if you're interested in, um, in 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 discussing this one with us like i said it's free of charge there's no obligation it's the backup and the server monitoring solution um, please do get in touch okay i'll start uh, the next and final um uh paul uh, uh let me uh yes let me load this one here um the next one is about um jay talked about database migration earlier i talked about it this morning during the uh, snowflake session um if you'd like to know more about our fast track accelerator solutions to go to um to do a database migration to cloud or not but database migration um uh, please uh, please do 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 answer this uh, this this poll okay um next question let me have a look uh, we have time to take two more um i will say okay so another one from um kim um to jay but again will be applicable to darius and uh, ken as well it's about multiple bi the question is how do you help your customers select the right tool for the visual we struggle with customers wanting to only use Tableau even when Bob J meets the requirements. Very good question. So we've commissioned a number of trade studies over the years. So when, it, when we first introduced Tableau to the environment, for example, our aeronautics business area uh, funded a specific business area over supply chain and production operations, funded and implemented 40 licenses, right? That continued to grow, and obviously, interest in that latest and greatest tool, you know, some like something like that catches like wildfire, right? So you had other interests in it. So we had two trade studies. We had a very granular trade study from an operational perspective that was funded by the business to evaluate Tableau versus business objects, uh, Lumira at the time, and then um, we also had a higher level uh, review of the solutions from a Gartner. Uh, paradigm. So using the different um, frameworks that they provide for evaluating BI and analytic solutions. And so we sort of have, a, and we try to follow that for other trade studies so that, that we have uh, backed up materials that can provide clear rankings that were done by uh, developers and people on the ground that evaluated each tool and the, and the components. And they can say and tell you, well, you know, for visualizations, we ranked Tableau uh, 4.5 in terms of uh, the number of available charts and Lumira a 3.5, you know, or they can kind of see where each tool beat each other for respective functionality. Um, and, and so that helps us kind of help people 
provide the right tool for the right job. But a lot of it is intangible. A lot of it is making sure that we get on the phone with people, we understand their requirements from a consulting standpoint, and we can help evaluate and tell people from our own experiences on projects whether this is something that they want to do in more of a dashboard solution or they want to do it in a reporting solution. And also just from having worked with the various tools, having people uh, participate in those conversations that have actually worked with the tools. Because somebody that's worked with Design Studio may understand the scripting needs and also the performance implications of having multiple data sources in that tool versus a Tableau, which operates a little differently in terms of their, so there's there's other other things that you can't just put on a piece of paper and give to people. You really have to sit with them and and, and coach them. Yeah, That's great. I'd like to add, add, add to what Jay said is that generally when you're doing a dashboard, you're doing an, a summary of your data. You're doing an aggregation. In a hybrid environment, you don't want to push all of your data up into the cloud. So when you're doing data at the transactional level, where there could be, you know, trillions of rows, you know, in your data source, Webby is, is very well suited to do that, right? You're doing a report, you're doing transactional data, there's a tremendous amount. And also within Webby, if you're building very complex SQL, that's, you know, that's something that it does very well. Um, I would, yeah, I would say it's the importance of having a COE, right? Developing a COE, starting to identify people that are not only data champions that understand specific types of data, for example, supply chain versus finance versus HR, but also have worked in certain tools. <clears throat> so you could have a website that lists people that says this person understands Tableau and web intelligence. And so you can reach out to those people and make it a self-service thing and say, listen, these are people that have volunteered in advance that if you have questions about these tools or solutions, you can reach out to them with questions ahead of time. And that way you're not bottlenecking and relying on people reaching out to your developers or a specific person that's in the COE, you have a tool champions and data champions that people can lean on to help them consult in those answers. Uh, absolutely, and um, yeah, I, I guess uh, the final word on this is having a COE um, um, around your analytics is, uh, is always very powerful. Um, we need to stop here. Um, I see many more questions from Kim, Francis, Lee, Deb, Sarah. Um, as promised earlier, we will uh, do a, 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 an offline Q&A with our speakers if they are, uh, <laughs> if they were really um, want to help us a little bit answering your questions. And this will all be uh, published online and sent to you with um, the recording. So once again, a big thank you to um, my, my uh, speakers today. Uh, thanks again.